Is the thing to uh, point their lights out? Yeah. Okay. Chloe, is it, is it ready? Everyone, uh, I'm going to call to order uh, this meeting of the uh, Capitola uh, Planning Commission. Uh, welcome, thank you for being here tonight, and uh, and I do want to acknowledge uh, that we have in our audience our still acting mayor of Capitola. So welcome, Michael, to the Planning Commission. Um, so with that, let's uh, have a roll call, please. Commissioner Welch here. Commissioner Smith here. Commissioner Westman? Here. Commissioner Newman? Here. Chair Story? Here. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we go any further, I do want to announce that the meeting is being cablecast live on Charter Communication Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T U-verse Channel 99. Um, it, it will uh, be recorded and replayed uh, next Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Um, and um, anyone can also uh, watch. Uh, the meeting on the city's website at www.cityofcapitola.org. And tonight our technician is Lynn Dutton. Thanks, Lynn, for uh, broadcasting uh, our meeting. Um, next I'll ask, uh, under oral communications, whether uh, com uh, commissioners have any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Seeing none, staff? Um, I just wanted to mention that for item for C106 Sacramento Avenue, we did have additional correspondences that came in, one from the Coastal Commission and one from the applicant's attorney. And should that stay on consent calendar, there is a the first condition that was suggested by the Coastal Commission we would like to add to the conditions of approval. I, I like to comment, so I'd like to pull that from the consent calendar. Um, K K TJ, can you hold that until Absolutely. we get uh, down there, um, and then I'll recognize uh, that motion. Uh, but um, uh, no other additions, no other or, additions deletions or deletions to the agenda this evening. Um, and so with that, next we'll move to public comments. It's an opportunity for members of the public to address the commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Um, does anyone uh, have anything they'd like to speak to the commission about? Good evening, Mayor. First planning commission meeting I've ever attended. <laughs> well, I have not been a planning commissioner. And it's uh, threefold. Thank you, Chair Story, planning commission. Thank you all for your dedicated service. And I want to say that including the planning commissions I was on, you are still 10 times better. This is the best planning commission I've ever observed in the city of Capitola. People think the city council make the city what it is. This is where it happens and people often forget that. So thank you all for your service, I appreciate it. Thank you Chair Story for stepping up and coming on to the City Council. I uh, sleep a little better at night when you're there. And lastly, I wanna single out one planning commissioner, and she knows who she is. <laughs> for eight years, Linda Smith has served as my planning commissioner. She has done so diligently, she's been decisive. Um, she has never come to me to ask the way to vote because she always knew how to vote and I was wise enough not to tell her how to vote. Uh, she also did one special favor for me. She didn't quit halfway through and make me scramble for a new planning commissioner. She has served eight years continuous. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You are a colleague. I consider you a peer and I also consider you a friend. And that is all, carry on. Thank you. Fine. Thank, thank you very much, Mayor Termini. Uh, uh, for those uh, really um, words of uh, commendation to us. Um, I'm not sure if, if it does ring true uh, uh, of all the planning commissions that have served the city of Capitola, um, but I think we will accept that with <laughs> gratitude um, and hopefully live up to it this evening in our last meeting together. 
So thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to make a public comment at this uh, time? Seeing none, um, I'm going to move on uh, to uh, commission comments. Commissioners, um, nothing. nothing here, nothing on this side. Uh, Can I say my piece now? And um, I'll leave it to you whether you want to do it now. You will have another opportunity later, but the, the, the room is packed now, mm -hmm. and <laughs> it may not be now. later. It's so still <laughs> early, and um, I would like to, if, if the commission would allow me so, while Mr. Mayor is still around. Um, tonight is the last night I'll sit up here. It's a little bit bittersweet for me, and I really want to thank Mike Termini, who I think might still be in the building, um, for allowing me to serve in this way. Um, seems like a long time ago. It's been eight years, and I sat here for the first time a little bit overwhelmed, but I had the privilege of sitting up here with some of the most experienced and thoughtful leaders in our city. My fellow commissioners in 2011 included three multi-term mayors, Gail Ortiz, Mick Ruth, and Ron Graves, and Ed Newman, one of the most level-headed, wise, and balanced people that I know. <laughs> Don't get a big head. <laughs> but what a great place it was for me to start. Um, TJ came along and brought an objective and pragmatic approach. And although I don't always agree with you, I've been honored <laughs> to serve with you. Um, and Susan has a wealth of experience and wisdom and capital of government history that was invaluable in helping us do the zoning code. I've learned a great deal from you, and I thank you for that. Um, Sam, what can I say? I've been proud to serve with you, and I'm really glad you'll be sitting on the council once again. Working with staff has really been a pleasure. Um, I know I'm going to miss some names, so forgive me in advance, but Danny and Jackie and Linda and Ryan and now Matt and Sasha and Chloe, you've all been responsive, ready to do whatever I needed and to help me out in, in all ways. Um, and Katie, you're just awesome. Uh, Rich was the right director at the right time, and Capitola is really lucky to have you stepping into his shoes, but right now I think you're what Capitola needs in the position. We've processed a lot of applications over the past eight years. We developed a new general plan and a new zoning code. We've had good discussions. We've had some disagreements, a lot of collaboration, <laughs> collaboration <laughs> and I can honestly say I don't think that we've approved any bad projects I enjoy walking around town and seeing um, projects that came to life that were approved while I've been a commissioner I've seen the ones that we we helped to tweak in the right direction a little bit and they're they're really good things and I hope that the community agrees that we've listened and have helped make controversial projects better and have stayed the course on Capitola's vision our new zoning code establishes some controls that have never been in place in Capitola before. It relaxes and clarifies restrictions that interfered with good projects in the past. It's streamlined, it's easier to navigate, and it's going to be a better tool for people wanting to improve their properties. And all in all, staff is going to have a whole lot more authority to help those projects that meet our requirements get through the system faster, reducing costs for everybody, and really taking a step in helping Capitola develop the right way. Many hours over the past three years have been spent um, trying to put together the best zoning code we could. And there are a lot of details and it gets complicated and staff has weighed through it. This commission has really weighed through a lot of stuff. And it's a balancing act. In the end, what you want is enough control to make sure the community grows in the right way and yet enough freedom to be creative and to welcome new people and new ideas into the community. I'm not happy with every detail of our zoning code, but I think we managed to do that, and I'm really glad that we got that job done for the city. Someone told me much once that that which does not grow dies, and so it is with Capitola. I'm proud to have been a part of building the infrastructure that the general plan and the zoning code represent, and I'm really proud to have worked with you guys. But now it's time for me to say farewell to public service for a while, and thank you again for allowing me to serve. Well, I, guess, um, I guess I should speak up now, too, because tonight's actually going to be my last Planning Commission meeting. And um, I was simply going to say 
goodbye to all of you and that it had been an honor to work with you. Uh, I think this has been an exceptionally good planning commission and um, we, we accomplished a lot and um, it, was, it was a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I look forward to coming back to the meetings and sitting in the audience and speaking from a different point of view. <laughs> well, um, any other comments from commissioners at this time? Well, I thank you uh, both <coughs> Linda and uh, Susan uh, for your service. Um, and I know I'm going to miss working with you. Um, I'll have some more comments later at the end of the meeting. Um, and um, but um, for now, let's why don't we get on with the uh, city's business? Um, and um, well, um, and which brings us to uh, the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of <coughs> November the first. Does anybody have any requested changes? I'll make a motion to approve. And there's a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously, Chloe. Um, next, we'll come to the consent calendar, and I've already heard one request to uh, pull item 4C, which is concerning 106 Sacramento Avenue. Um, and I'm going to um, insert that um, under item. Um, 5A, which is 116 Grand Avenue, so we'll consider 106 after 116 Grand Avenue. Um, and I will take this opportunity to announce that uh, because of the proximity of where I live, I'm, uh, um, I have to recuse myself from a 106 <coughs> Sacramento project application, so I'll be turning it over the meeting to the <coughs> vice chair at that time. Do any members of the public wish to pull uh, any of the other consent items? We had two other ones. Uh, uh, a is uh, 620 Capitol Avenue, which is for a sign permit. Uh, and item B is uh, a, uh, a project at 607 Oak Drive. Any request to pull either of those items? Seeing none. Uh, Commissioners, any desire to pull out of there of those? Uh, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the balance of the consent calendar. Also move. Is there a second? I'll second it. So motion <coughs> and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, the motion, that motion passes unanimously, Chloe. Um, Next, we'll move on to our public hearings for the evening. Um, and the <coughs> first item will be 116 Grand Avenue. This is an application for a design permit and conditional use permit uh, for an addition to a historic single family home located in the R1 zoning district. Uh, we'll begin with a uh, staff report. <coughs> Good evening, Commissioners and Chairperson Story. The applicant is requesting approval for a design permit and conditional use permit for an addition to an historic single family home in the single family zoning district. The existing single family residence at 116 Grand was built in 1905. The single story three bedroom home is approximately 1,499 square feet and has a 420 square foot detached garage. The proposed 320 square foot addition will sit on the back of the home and the exterior materials will match the existing wood siding, wood trim windows and shingle roofing. A small covered breezeway will attach the garage to the home. Because the home is an historic structure, the plans were submitted to the city's contracted architectural historian, Leslie Dill. Ms. Dill requested that a piece of vertical trim be removed and language highlighting the home's historic nature be added to the cover sheet. The applicant submitted plans with Ms. Dill's revisions. The property is in the geological hazards district as it is within 200 feet of the bluff. 
Capitola Municipal Code requires a geological report for any bluff top development proposed within 200 feet of the cliff edge. The report must show that the project's design and setback provisions are designed to assure stability for at least 50 years. The applicant submitted a letter from Zinn Geology indicating the property and new development are outside the projected 50-year bluff top retreat line. The property is non-conforming because the existing home sits within the front and side yard setbacks. However, the building official determined that the proposed structural alterations are less than 80% of the present fair market value of the non-conforming structure, so they are permissible structural alterations. Staff recommends the Planning Commission approve Project 18-0481 based on the conditions and findings for approval. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners on the staff report? Hearing none, I'll open it up to the public. Is there a presentation by the applicant or the applicant's representative? Hi, Dennis. Good evening, uh, honorable members of the Planning Commission. Um, this is... Uh, you, you probably a few of you have seen this application before when we did the, the remodel on the main house of this thing and it, I think overall it's really kept within the historic character of of, of the house um, the uh, the garage was added in the last application now we're connecting me to we're adding a, a bathroom and a closet it's not been an easy process we've been in process 10 months and not due to staff's problem but problem in actually when you build on Depot Hill now the 200 foot setback requires the geologic hazards report to be done that that's now being enforced um, and um, <clears throat> the other issue was um, was uh, we had to do a number of modifications to get through the historic part of it as far as um, Leslie Dill's approval but I, I think we've made it there I think we have a good project here um, someone walking down the street wouldn't know that what is historic from not being historic uh, she's allowed us to match the siding. We do have a demarcation strip on there, but the siding's being matched, and so I think uh, um, I think it's a good project. Um, I also have with me is uh, Joe McLean, who is the owner of the property, um, and a couple neighbors have also showed up. So um, thank you for your time. We we approve of the conditions of approval. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have one question. For All right, uh, for Dennis. For Den uh, yeah, uh, Dennis. If one just question. Then add a question. Um, when we reviewed this in 2013, the, there were carriage doors that were um, sort of important. Is there any, I didn't see them in the plan. Is there any plan to continue their use like they are now or are they being removed? That's, that's a good question, Linda, because it was required us in the, in the initial application and Leslie Dill did not do the historic. Leslie comes in a different story and she said, they're goofy, why are you doing this? And so she asked us to take them off there and so we conceded to do that. Okay. okay. Any other members of the public wish to address the commission on this uh, item? <coughs> Seeing none, I'm going to, uh, yeah. Commission. Uh, my name is Mark Kane. <coughs> my wife and I live one house away from Joe and Gloria's home. <coughs> we just went through the whole process and, and had a nice uh, result, you know, thanks to the, to the board, you know, you guys. And I just want to say Maureen and I are in support of uh, the project, and we love that it's not going up another story. That's, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Any other comments? Yes. S step on up. Yeah. I know the horse has already left the barn, as it were, but I still have it stuck in my craw that it, that house was allowed to encroach on city property with their rock retaining wall that has caused an incredible bottleneck for people who drive up there, park, try to get turned around, and uh, unfortunately in the past did damage to the, the neighbor's gate. And from experience, that little supposed turnaround driveway that faces the bluff that was added later really does no good to um, facil facilitate the use of that particular property so with any luck at all someday that will change and the city will take back the property that the public deserves to have access to thank you right. thank you anyone else wish to address the Commission uh, on this uh, project 
seeing none, um, I'm going to close the microphone up front. I'll bring it back to the commissioners for discussion and uh, action. <coughs> um, is there a particular commissioner that would like to begin? Or well, I'll I'll jump in. Um, I agree with Dennis's comments that the revisions that were made after the 2013 review were very well done in, in keeping with the historic nature of the structure. Um, the, there were two items I went back and looked, and there were two items that were really important back then. One was the carriage doors, and the second was um, the turnaround. And I see in these plans no effect or no change on the turnaround, so I'm assuming that that, that stays. And the, the carriage doors, um, Leslie did not include them at all in her report. I personally don't feel that they help tell the story, so I'm fine with having them go. Um, I think the implementation and what we were looking at when we approved them being used as shutters was different, and um, I have no problem with the approving the plan the way it's proposed now. All right, thank you. Any other commissioners? I really don't have any comments. I do like the fact that the exterior material is going to be the same on the building with the demarcation line. I think that's a nice <coughs> step forward. Okay. I think this would be a consent item, except that it's a uh, conditional use permit is required. So I have no problem. I see no issues. Right. Um, I, I would say, I well, I don't really have any issues. I, I would concur with the lady that got up and spoke about the property because I learned a valuable lesson on that as a planning commissioner uh, don't um, well you have to be a little more inquisitive about things I actually take a tape measure with me now so uh, on the staff report the homeowner may not know this I'm sure you know there's something about it but uh, the staff report said no bollards to be removed which the little metal posts out there and I took the staff report being where it was at and they actually removed two bollards and expanded the yard out which um, creates a little bit of an issue for me um, when I live in the area. So then all the neighbors want to go, want to know why do they get a move into the public right away. Uh, it wasn't until after the fact that we made them put the turnaround in because the neighbor's gate was getting bashed in from turning around. So I do have that heartburn, but I can't put that on the new homeowner. That's really more, I think, to do with the way we handled that within internally in the city. So with that, I support the project and I don't really care about those doors in the front of the house that mm -hmm. hung up there so okay um, would somebody like to make a motion then I'll move approval of this project as um, documented okay the, yeah there's a motion to approve is there a second I'll second okay, there's a motion and a the second uh, um, so under just under further discussion um, I just want to acknowledge even though this is a historical home um, but it complies with our regulations in every respect uh, it has the architectural historians uh, blessing uh, and consultation on the project um, and with that I see no reason uh, to uh, uh, deny the project or add any additional conditions so with that I'll just call for a voice vote all in favor Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously, Chloe. Um, uh, congratulations. Um, thank you. Next, that brings us to um, the uh, item pulled from the consent calendar, which is concerning 106 Sacramento. Um, and as I uh, had stated earlier, um, I have a conflict uh, because of proximity. Uh, so I'm going to recuse myself and turn it over to the vice chair to run the meeting. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. I apologize from the very beginning. And I'm going to pass my cup down and hope I can get just a little more water. Um, this application is for 106 Sacramento Avenue. Uh, it's a design permit for a 700 and 64 square foot addition with a new second story to the existing single family house. Um, and we will have a staff presentation. Thank you, Vice Chairman Westman. Uh, yeah, the project site is a large 30,719 square foot lot located at 106 Sacramento Avenue, 
within the single family R1 zoning district and the geologic hazards GH district. The applicant is proposing a 764 square foot addition to the existing 3,943 square foot house. The new addition is located outside the required 50 year bluff retreat line. The addition requires planning commission approval of a design permit and a coastal development permit. The application complies with all development standards of the R1 and GH districts. Just really quickly, there's the existing site plan, and I'll explain the two lines in just a second. Here's the proposed site plan. As you can see, a portion of the existing home is located within the 50 year setback shown in dark blue, making it a non conforming structure. The proposed additions are shown in light blue. The building official determined that the proposed structural alterations are less than 80% of the present fair market value of the non conforming structures, so they are permissible structural alterations. Here's the existing floor plan and the proposed floor plan uh, on the first floor and the additions are in light blue. And here are the uh, second story additions, or addition singular. Uh, as you can see, it's outside of the, uh, the blue 50 year setback and the 50 year setback plus estimated sea level rise influence indicated in red. Here are the existing and proposed northwest elevations. The existing and proposed northeast elevations. Southeast elevations. And southwest elevations. Also included is a uh, rendering from the end of Sacramento Avenue. Uh, it doesn't include all of the uh, trees and shrubs and things indicated on the landscape plan, but it does give you a good idea of the uh, proposed development. And here's the proposed landscape plan. And with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission review the application and approve project application 18 0143 based on the conditions and findings for approval, plus one additional condition, which uh, Community Development Director Hurley mentioned earlier which I will now put up on the screen. Uh, in response to the Coastal Commission's letter, we are requesting that Planning Commission include the condition recommended by the Coastal Commission that acknowledges the coastal hazards risk associated with bluff top development as shown in this slide. Uh, and at this point, I think the Community Development Director will provide some addition, additional commentary related to this project. Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, so you received a letter yesterday afternoon from the Coastal Commission and under our policy we look at the development of a project we look at 50 percent of structural improvements to the property and we had our um, at the time building official review the project and they worked with us continuously until it came down under the 50 percent of structural improvements to the project in and in that knowing that they hadn't exceeded the allowance for future uh, arm armoring of the bluff we continued this project um, at multiple hearings because the applicant continued to work with the Coastal Commission to they wanted an assurance that they had done their calculations correctly and that they wouldn't be subject to that in the future. Um, the Coastal Commission in the letter we received yesterday, they, um, they're applying a new standard that is drafted within a sea level rise policy document. Um, the policy document was, I'll pull this up, shown here <coughs> is an adopted <coughs> document but it's a policy and what's enforced is the California Coastal Act and at a local level what's enforced is our local coastal plan which is in fact our zoning code and at several other um, portions of our municipal code but we've followed our municipal code in the review of this application we have not applied the new policy guidance in this document and there's actually another guidance document for residential development that hasn't been adopted to this day because of the um, the way in which they're calculating um, new development <coughs> and, it's, and they're looking at a cumulative development over time since the time that the coastal act was adopted so anything from <coughs> I think it was 74 forward um, any you know the cumulative um, 
improvements to a house would be calculated within their 50% calculation under the new documents. So at, at this time, uh, what you're reviewing is an addition to a single family home. We're not looking at, at armoring for a for this property in the future when they do come forward to the to look at if they'd like armoring that will go to the coastal commission it's their purview and at that point the coastal commission with the law that's put in place will review that application under the law that's in place so we feel that it would be um, incorrect for us to add a condition for an application that is not in under this time and it should be reviewed under the law that is in place at the time that that application goes forth to the Coastal Commission. So with that, we're just suggesting, we, we do think the first condition is good, stating that yes, you're on the bluff and there's some risks involved and um, they're willing to move forward with those risks that are involved. Well, thank you for that explanation. It makes it a lot clearer for me and I hope for everyone else um, what was happening with this. Sure. Yeah, um, it's still not real clear to me. Okay. How does the, do we know how the Coastal Commission determines of what percent, the modification, they've got <laughs> numbers for the roof and numbers for different components, and how do they put all that together? So they, that that's what's in the new policy document, is breaking it down from just previously a structural um, calculation to actually looking at every component of the the roof they're counting square yeah. feet of the roof. square feet mm -hmm. i believe of the roof uh, um i mean what we've got really doesn't tell me how any of that was determined it's just kind of conclusory well it's it's very subjective right i mean i agree we don't we don't have any valid information about how the coastal commission came up with their analysis okay well you answer my question i'll have some comments when we get to Okay. So it is their their methodology is in this it is it's in a well it, it's stated in this first document that was adopted but it's refined better within the um, residential policy document which has not yet been adopted by the coastal commission and is subject to a lot of feedback from different jurisdictions not willing you know yeah. Uh, have any uh, specifics as to the application of that not yet adopted policy to this project. Yeah, other than that document. So. I have one question, if I could. Go ahead. Staff. Um, so, um, Katie, the, the condition that you're suggesting that we, we include, did we have any legal review of that condition? We did. I worked with Tony Condotti closely today on this application, and his suggestion was move forward with that first condition, but it's not the appropriate time for us to have the second, the other conditions. But you felt that this condition was worded correctly. It's not... Um, item E, the property owner's <coughs> responsible that any adverse effects to property caused by the permitted development shall be fully the responsibility of the property owners. That statement to me is really vague. It's what property are they talking about? Are they now going to say that the effects to property anywhere along the bluff? I, I don't, I'm not, if I were the homeowner, I'm not really sure that that would be clear enough for me. Could you repeat which, which section um, is it? It's number 1E, the e. very final okay. one. That any adverse effects to the property caused by the permitted development shall be fully the responsibility of the property owner? Yeah, it's to property, not to the property. Mm. That may be one of my issues with it. There, there's oh. not, the word the is not in there. We could add the word the, so it's. to wow. the owner's property. <coughs> yep. I just, before we, before we condition it that way, I'd just like to make sure it's clear. And, and perhaps we might want to ask the owner if they're comfortable with the wording change in that condition. Okay, that concludes staff's presentation. Uh, the Morrisseys, uh, the property owners here. Um, I appreciate your, your questions and your confusion mm -hmm. uh, about this issue. Um, maybe I can just make my comments briefly, and I think I may be able to address the question that you have. Um, <clears throat> I think it's been made clear that the new development is all landward of the 50-year setback, 
and that um, the entire scope of work is less than 80% of the value, which is the applicable standard. And so therefore the project as designed and as contemplated um, is consistent with the Capitola LCP. Um, um, ultimately, the Morrisseys are entitled to rely on the LCP and actually, the city of Capitola is bound by that LCP as well and doesn't have any authority to go outside of that to look at other guidance and other documents um, or what the Coastal Commission has done in other jurisdictions because those are not applicable. Um, the Solana Beach LCP is applicable in Solana Beach only. A denial or an approval or a condition in Marin County has nothing to do um, with what's allowable or what conditions are required or permitted or not permitted under the Capitola LCP. I think, that, I think that's um, very important. Um, <clears throat> to address the, the guidance, um, I've got a, a copy of the link. First of all, did you all get the, a copy of the letter that I submitted today? Yes. yes. Okay, good. I think that pretty well lays it out. But um, at the very beginning of both of these documents, both the unanimously adopted um, guidance from 2015, as well as the still uh, not yet adopted March 2018 version of the guidance says, this document is guidance. This document is not regulations. It says, the guidance is advisory and not a regulatory document or legal standard of review for the actions that the commission or local governments may take under the Coastal Act. Such actions are subject to the applicable requirements of the Coastal Act, the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act, certified local coastal programs, and other applicable laws and regulations as applied in the context of the evidence of the record for that action. Um, I think that pretty well spells it out. Um, th these are the hopes, intentions, and desires of, of the Coastal Commission to limit bluff top development, but it really has nothing to do with what's allowable under the LCP. And um, I th believe that staff I is interpreting the LCP properly, uh, both as to the new development landward of the setback, as well as the 80, less than 80% value threshold um, for the entire project. Um, so if you have any other questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to ad address them. I don't have any questions. Anyone have any? So if we ended up with some kind of condition, such as has been suggested, just a um, notification that there's a, a geological risk here, what would be the applicant's position on proposed conditions four and five for a deed restriction and real estate disclosures? Oh, it would, it would be a, it would absolutely opposed to that. I mean, the Coastal Commission has no authority. The Coastal Commission has appeal authority over this project only. And even as to a future seawall, they've only got appeal authority. And um, if, I, if I could read um, here, so the, under the Coastal Act, it's Coastal Act Section 30603B1, um, the Coastal Commission's appeal of a Capitola approval of a project, quote, shall be limited to an allegation that the development does not conform to the standards set forth in the Certified Local Coastal Program or public access policies set forth in this division of the Coastal Act. Well, since the project has no impact on public access, that means the basis for any commission appeal of the project must be limited to the project's consistency with Capitola's LCP. And there's nothing in Capitola's LCP that requires even what may seem like an innocuous condition that's been proposed <coughs> tonight. Um, it's, I think it's a fairly slippery slope. Um, and so certainly with, with, the, with the waiver um, conditions, th there, there's no way that, th that those can be upheld. And as to the first, it just, it just seems sort of pointless. It's sort of like saying, um, to some degree, a, a chainsaw is dangerous. Well, of, of course it is, but once we begin, or once the, the Capitola Planning Commission and City Council uh, begins to allow um, the Coastal Commission to start imposing conditions that really have no tie back to the applicable document, which is the Capitola LCP, I think, I think we're all in trouble. Does that answer the question? Okay. Any other questions? No, thank you, Mr. Oliver. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I, I do have some comments before we move forward. I, there, I guess Ms., uh, Ms., Mrs. Graven is not in the audience. Or anybody else from the Coastal Commission? Yeah, that's a shame. I got a few questions or, or actually comments probably. 
I, I find this this um, process um, uh, well appalling is really the only word I can come up with right now that we uh, have an agency a government agency that puts these type of restrictions on property owners on uh, and I don't I'm not going to argue climate change with anybody that's not what it's about really let's just give it the credit and say there is sea rise although the document they use from the 2012 uh, NRC says it's synthetic data meaning we don't have the data so they use computer models to present that but um, let's just say it is what and, and let's say that uh, it'd be unfortunate for uh, the Morrisseys maybe in 35 years 50 years to have their house teetering on the edge, edge of the bluff but you know sometimes we take risk as property owners you look at what happened up at the campfire in Paradise. We just lost, what, nearly 14,000 homes up there. But that fire had been predicted for 50 years up there. And uh, we live in environments like that. You're going to live on the bluff. You take an accepted risk. And as Mr. Oliver said, it's, it's almost um, ridiculous to have to state the obvious. So I would almost agree that not to go along with the Coastal Commission's recommendations, even for item one. I, to me, uh, and we're we're going through this process with the uh, this the adoption with the city council right now, or with the uh, coastal commission right now. But this idea that they can tell us we can, or the property owners along the the bluff can only do improvements up to 50 percent unless they're going to re-roof their house, and that can only be so many years. And, and by the way, it's not just on the bluff; it's also along the riparian, the creek that goes up. Those homes up there are under the same restrictions. I find way overreaching from the Coastal Commission. You know what, take, I'm all for having our safe Monterey Bay. I'm glad that um, it's a sanctuary bay and that we take care of the water out there and we, I'm all for all that. But property owners uh, should not be, um, have to deal with the, this bureaucracy. You look at the expenses, even at the 116 grand, they had to do a report, uh, a geological report the Morrissey's had to do a geological, geological study. The Coastal Commission didn't do their math correctly the first time until the attorneys caught the uh, error in their, their math and had the setback much closer than what it was. So, um, and, and now they had to pay attorneys. The Morrissey have to pay attorneys on top of that. I, I, I'm venting is what I'm doing right now, but I hope the city, as we go through uh, the adoption of our zoning uh, codes with the Coastal Commission, holds fast and unfortunately we're a very small community and it would be nice to be you know working in uh, collaboration with the whole coastal in the state to stand up to the coastal commission because uh, I, I don't know how in 15 20 years when they need a new roof they're going to have to come up and say well you're beyond your 50 percent uh, valuation so now you don't you, you're not allowed to do the repairs on your house and anyone who lives on the bluff uh, or anywhere in Capitola, but especially the bluff, realizes that, you know, windows, for example, uh, have to be replaced. There's a lot of work that goes on to maintain these houses. So um, I wish someone from the Coastal Commission was here so I could vent to them and not to you and not to the people in the uh, TV audience. But um, yeah, this, this is very unfortunate. So I'm all for the uh, project, but I would uh, be in favor of not adding the uh, item number one as recommended by staff. So move. <coughs> do we want to come to a consensus? Did we finish the public hearing? I think oh, that we did. We that. probably <laughs> need to close. <laughs> oh. We weren't going to get in your way, TJ. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think we had a commissioner who was uh, <laughs> anxious to get, get some yeah. comments in. Hi, Dan Hi. Gomez, Fuse Architects. I'm the architect on the project. The Morrissey's wish they could be here. They're out of town, unfortunately. Um, I just wanted to state that um, we've been, this project's been a long time in the works and we actually had a more extensive proposal that still fit within the LCP. And based on our discussions and the Morrissey's wanting to do kind of what they thought was best in the interest of the city of Capitola and working with the Coastal Commission, we actually worked extensively with uh, the planning department and with Coastal Commission going back and forth, sending them documents figuring it out, and they agreed with us. They agreed with everything that they had proposed to us and all the restrictions that they had set. And so what happened is that the last minute they came back with some more stuff that became, that obviously is what uh, Mr. Oliver stated. And it's, it's, it was frustrating for us because the Morrissey's have spent a lot of time and committed a lot of 
their efforts and our efforts into doing this and to presenting a project that we thought would be a great addition to the city of Capitola. And so we agree with planning staff's uh, initial recommendations and um, we hope that you guys agree as well and that this project can move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to speak to us before we officially close our public hearing? Okay, we'll, we'll close comments from the public and we'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, we've heard from Commissioner Welsh. I'd like to hear from the balanced man at the end. The good <laughs> Thank you for your comments at the beginning. Um, well, first, this is just kind of an aside. It's interesting to me that the Coastal Commission has evolved over time. For the first 10 or whatever years, the Coastal Commission was at war with individual property owners, um, fighting cases and winning most of them. And now it's at war with local jurisdictions up and down California. So the battle is between the Coastal Commission and the cities and the counties has kind of shifted. Here we have the property owner too. But um, I do have a concern uh, about this. That the fact that all the new construction is inside the bluff line is significant to me. If there were anything that were over the bluff line, maybe we'd have a little different issue here. But the only concern I have is notice um, to future property owners, this property owner, that there is, a, there is an issue here, with, at least with the Coastal Commission. And uh, when we approve something, members of the public tend to uh, make that more than it is sometimes and think that because the staff approved it or because the Planning Commission approved it that uh, everything is fine and there can't be any, ch any further problems with it. But here there is, there is a potential issue with uh, armoring down the road on this property, which I think it would be nice to have anybody, I, probably anybody who buys the property be aware of that anyway. But uh, so I kind of favor what the staff has recommended to have some kind of notification included in the conditions. And I mean, I, I even thought some kind of deed restriction notice would be appropriate also, because we do do that uh, on, on occasions. So that anyone who um, got into this property would at least have their eyes open as to that issue. Other than that, I, I, I mean, I, I have no problem with the application. Okay. Um, before serving here, I was a realtor, and I know that in the state of California, disclosure laws are detailed and deep, and if you know anything, you have to disclose it or there's trouble to be bound. The problem that I have with the recommendation from staff, and, and I really appreciate that you did review it with the attorneys and that you've eliminated a lot of the conditions, but the wording of this is not something that um, I'm really comfortable with. If it said something to the effect of in 2018 when this remodel was done, this was the map and this is where the 50 year lines were, I would be fine with that, you know, conditioning that that notice needs to be somehow attached to the property. But the way that they've gone about each and every bullet um, if I were putting myself in the place of the homeowner and looking at it myself, I'd go hire an attorney to review it before I'd be comfortable signing that. So I don't think that I have enough knowledge legally in this case to condition that all of those items have to be included. So what I'm hearing from you, just so I'm clear, is that you're not in favor of adding uh, this condition number one that was recommended by the community development director that's correct and commissioner Welch felt the same way um, commissioner newman i tended to uh, favor having that condition added i don't think it's particularly harmful to the applicant uh, just for, for, as i stated i think the additional notice is a good idea. I don't really see how it uh, affects the uh, progress of the project in any way. Well, <clears throat> I think we're sort of divided because I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Newman. I, I don't see the harm in adding this particular condition um, uh, to the application. Um, 
and um, I also think that uh, over the years we have had a pretty consistent history of including a condition that uh, we have something record recorded that would uh, make future property owners uh, aware of, of issues like this on properties. And I don't think that would be something new that we were doing just because the Coastal Commission, uh, you know, it had come up on this application. Uh, my recollection is it's been done a number of times throughout the city for, for various issues. Um, so I'm trying to figure well, out where, where we go well, from Well, I'll, I'll move because I'll tell you, I, I, I'm totally in favor of the project. And really, my own only bent against it is giving the Coastal Commission any any uh, hand in this, and, and because I'm just obviously frustrated with uh, their overreach. So I don't think it's it's asking too much. It's it to me it's stating the obvious as it was was mentioned. So I could move to include that. I just think again it's on that slope. I think when um, as mentioned, in fact, I'm kind of familiar with this house being sold. There's a lot of studies that get happen when people so. It's not like they're going to go into it naive and all of a sudden, well, we didn't know that the, the uh, ocean was a harm to our property. But if, if that's what it's going to take to move it forward, then I, I'm not going to obviously vote against it. I just don't see the need. Um, if I may, we forwarded um, <coughs> our intent to bring this to you tonight with the change in the recommendation to add the condition number one. So the attorney um, may have spoken with the Morrisseys, and I'm not sure if they're open to... It wasn't exactly clear to me whether or not if, so if condition right. one is on the permit, if that's an issue or acceptable. <coughs> I apologize. I understand that public comments have been closed, but um, I guess at a minimum, I would ask that the word the be added <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> as Commissioner Smith has suggested, and then, and then we can go from there. Um, but again, I, 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 yeah, I, I've made my point, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But under discussion. I I mean, in a way, this might be beneficial to the applicant because it doesn't really slow down their project and it may prevent uh, an appeal. I understood. No. I agree. Okay, so we have consensus about adding uh, condition one with the word the added in as recommended by Commissioner Smith. And the other item um, which you raised was the deed restriction. The deed restriction. And I, I agree with you that we do that quite often. And I mean, it would actually be the exception if we didn't. I mean, don't we have, I don't like their language, but don't we have more standard language for a deed restriction in this situation? Yes. Um, you know, we, we utilize deed restrictions all the time with secondary units, making it clear that the owner has to either live in the primary home or the second home. So there, there could be a deed restriction on this that it's subject to we a coastal use development on permit. hazards, too, I think. Uh, I can check back at old permits. I, I haven't run into one recently, and, and I've been looking at bluff permits for well, this. Let me try a motion to approve. May I? Go, go ahead. To approve the project with uh, the condition one as proposed by uh, the staff and a deed restriction condition that is not as proposed by the Coastal Commission but is a standard Capitola deed restriction for this situation. Yeah. Do we have a second? I can't go that far now. I, I, I can, you got me part way, but I can't go with the deed restriction. Clarify the deed restriction. The deed restriction would simply um, notice that there's hazard here. Yes, basically notice condition one. I'll second that motion. Okay. Not any of the wording here and not any of the item number four real estate no. disclosure, right. no. but just a standard that we've used in the past for bluff hazard notice. So it's not really restricting anything on the deed. It's simply a notice on the deed. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Um, do we want to have any more discussion or call for the vote? Well, I, I'm, I'm kind of holding tight. I, I met you part way there. I, I don't, I can't, I just don't want to give them any more than what they have. To me, it's a, it's just obvious and anyone purchasing is going to understand. So I don't know the need to add more conditions on a, a project that would, if it was the next lot over, we, we would have been on the consent calendar. So 
I guess my logic is I don't want to penalize these no, guys. No, I'm not going to penalize. Coastal... We're, we're going to get this passed tonight, one way or the okay. other. Okay. All right. So, uh, can we have a roll call vote? Yes. Commissioner Welch? No. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Newman? Yes. And Vice Chair Westman? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> So the project passes. And Sam can come back. And I'm, <coughs> excuse my voice again, but hopefully at the end of the yeah. meeting, we can have a little further discussion about the new zoning ordinance and coastal requirements. Okay. <coughs> Susan. Let's move on to item 5B, which is uh, a, an update to the general plan, land use element, and land use map. Um, staff report, please. Take one minute to fix my display settings. Um, sorry, there we go. Okay, no. <laughs> okay. Um, before you tonight is the general plan uh, cleanup. Our general plan was originally adopted in 2014. And we brought, Rich actually, uh, Gruno, the previous community development director, brought suggested changes to you in March. And I'm sorry that I'm back in December with the final <laughs> edits, but we also, he brought them to city council as well. And it wasn't on the, I should have got it here sooner. But anyway, we've got it out. It was noticed for a 60 day period to the public. And notice was sent to all the entities that need to be noticed for a general plan update. We've circulated notice throughout Capitola. I'm sure you've seen the signs around town for all properties that are going to be changed under the land use uh, map. And really what we're doing is um, some cleanup here. There were some issues with our previous land use map within the general plan that we caught at the time of updating the zoning map. There were also items that were after all the conversations on the zoning map that the general direction in the land use map was incorrect and we took a step back to say okay now this is the direction we're going with the zoning code so our general plan land use map needs to <coughs> echo it um, and then there were a couple of specific items that when this was brought to you previously um, there was the recommendation to proceed with the recommended changes, but also clarification that the parcel with additional floor area ratio was specifically for the Capitola Theater site, and then also that the land use map should reflect the um, the the uh, zoning code and in, in the terminology that we use, such as instead of SFR1, and just make it really easy for the general public to understand and for us to understand. So. With that, I'm going to jump into the proposed changes to the land use section element of the general plan. And then after that, um, I have a slide for each of the properties that was under review for the land use map. And I'll ask which ones you'd like me to speak to rather than going through every single property. And if members of the public are here with questions, I'll have slides and I can provide explanations of any of the proposed changes. We have had quite a few phone calls this week due to all the posting that was placed around town and the notices that went out. So, um, so the first change is a revision to the <coughs> land use table. Um, now that the Rispin, um, to add the planned Rispin Mansion Park and then to remove the term planned in front of McGregor Park. Also to revise the um, image of the map to show the Rispin Park on the map of parks. Next, this is the, one of the larger items that I think you may want to discuss this evening, but 
Um, in our previous general plans throughout the years, there's only been a maximum density related to residential uses. So within different residential uses for multifamily, there's specific densities that can be achieved from anywhere from one, um, 10 units per acre up to 20 units per acre. But under commercial, there's never been a maximum dwelling units per acre. It's always been a subject of floor area ratio. So really, what a developer can achieve within a certain box is how it's always been regulated under the general plan. And here I have the old general plan up, and you'll see the note that commercial for commercial, it allows for different, different intensities and types of commercial activities within the community. And that's really speaking to the fact that there isn't a limited number of dwelling units per acre. Um, and under the new general plan, that was the intent. Um, residential, there's max densities. And then within the commercial, there's max floor area ratios that were assigned. And within the new general plan, there's also those incentivized areas that we're all well aware of, one in the village at the theater site and one on 41st Avenue. Um, on the next slide, the, the old zoning code was also consistent with the, how the old general plan was. Commercial and mixed use zones never had max density limits. They were controlled by floor area ratio and development standards. However, the new zoning code, um, there is a new maximum of uh, 20 units per acre that's shown in the community commercial and um, Sorry, it's the regional commercial and the community commercial zones. Under the new code, the mixed-use neighborhood, which is previously CN, still does not have a max density limit. I believe um, that the max limit was accidentally put into the new zoning code. Um, I, I went back, and it came at the first um, zoning draft that was published. It was in there. Um, I don't know why there. You know, it wasn't one of our issue and options items that we discussed. Um, you know, typically when folks call in and ask, such as like the mall property, what's the max density there? The answer has always been, oh, it's floor area ratio. But I'll let you know that under the residential, it can go up as high as one per twenty. So we wouldn't suggest going over the one to twenty, one per twenty. It's really a, just a good frame of reference. But so. Um, this, in, in me taking over this project of the general plan updates and realizing our new code has a maximum in the um, community commercial and regional commercial, if we want to keep with the original thinking that you look at form and you look at development standards within your commercial zones, then I would suggest that when we do our zoning code update that we remove the, one per, the 20 per acre. Um, so that that would support the proposed revision here that this, it was a clarification that residential uses and commercial and mixed use land use designations shall be subject to FAR and not density calculations. And I <coughs> put, sorry, this image here to show that it's not, you can't tell by the box how many dwelling units are in there but they had to fit within the box, the floor area ratio, and that's how it would be calculated under the new code. So that is staff's suggestion there. I don't know if you'd like me to stop, to because I think this is the one item that. Yeah, this uh, in my mind, this is a significant change. item. I, it may be a good moment maybe to pause and uh, see if there's questions from commissioners uh, well, on this I issue or. I raised this item with staff simply because we saw there was this contradiction going on that mm -hmm. didn't make sense to me. Um, but I agree with their analysis. You know, in the general plan, we've always used floor area ratio, not density. And, um, you know, I'm comfortable with that because that's going to regulate, you know, the size and shape of the box that's going to go there. And uh, for me personally, I'm not concerned as long as they meet, you know, the parking requirements which they would have to, whether they're, you know, four small units in there or two medium-sized units. I think that's something that the uh, <coughs> needs to be evaluated project by project with the developers. All right, thank you. <coughs> um, anyone, TJ? No, no, I would just concur that I, I think we could clean that up and 
Yeah, I, w I would agree. Okay. Um, I did have, I mean, I wanted to ask, you know, this question that maybe raised this concern. Um, I think normally I, I would be fine with reverting to the, uh, you know, floor area ratio and our other form standards uh, within the commercial zone, uh, for residential within the commercial zone. Um, however, with the movement um, coming from Sacramento uh, to encourage the development of more housing uh, and to uh, prohibit local jurisdictions from using, uh, for example, parking standards. Hmm. Um, I d I'm just, I, I, well, I wanted to ask, what do you see as maybe the consequence of that? Um, and if we eliminate the density altogether, uh, could we find ourselves maybe um, uh, creating um, such density and not being able to assert our parking requirements? And of course, we know what the consequences of that may be. Um, so I, I think I just wanted to ask um, along those lines and what those impacts may be. And, and maybe this is just a matter of, of passing on our recommendations and concerns to the city council. Uh, on these particular uh, questions? Excellent question. Um, within the density bonus regulations, you're allowed to add to actually what the box would be. So what the floor area would be, you're allowed to utilize so many exceptions depending on what type of affordable project you're bringing forward and the amount and, and the level of affordability. So. I'd like to take time with that, and I could sure. put that into the staff report if you want to recommend that we move forward to City Council, or I can return with more conversation about this um, in the new year. But I, I can take a closer look at what those uh, regulations, you know, what the impact could be. Because I, my next slide is actually talking about the fact that in our general plan currently, we don't specify the different levels of densities that are allowed within um, mixed, um, within multifamily, and how that could hurt us within the density bonus calculations. And that's why we want to tie those back into our general plan. So, excellent point. And I, I'd like to sit down and pencil this out to make sure I understand exactly what the implications could be if we don't have a density tied to our commercial areas. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking with the Claire's project that we did, didn't we run into that problem where our density, uh, bonus density was, and this uh, 20 per acre was more lenient than what the state was doing? So uh, it seems to me like it was kind of hurting us in that project. So that's why I was. Right. As I, I recall, we were required to round up right. um, on the calculations. Right. You know, and, and I know we have the bonuses for affordable housing, and I certainly support that. But I'm even, I mean, the atmosphere that I'm noticing out of Sacramento um, and with their, um, I, I guess, push to provide more housing um, and for local jurisdictions to meet their RENA numbers, their required, um, you know, housing numbers, uh, I'm afraid that, that I, um, I can just see that going to well, now all parking requirements for any type of housing are, are being eliminated. Um, and I, I just think, I mean, that would be serious consequences to us. Now on the question, I, I guess I'll leave it up to other commissioners whether you would like to, those of you that are going to be going, continuing on would like to see this come back to you for more discussion before moving in on the city council. What's the uh, negative to uh, getting more input on this? Are we? holding it up in some way? No, um, there's no negative. We can bring it back. It's been noticed. It doesn't need to be, you know, we would just continue it and. Well, from my view, I think it would be worthwhile yeah, for it to maybe for yeah. Katie to be able to study that, look at the real consequences yeah. on our community um, uh, and to bring back a fuller analysis to the Planning Commission. Great. Well, I'll carry on to the next item in the land use. Yes. Thank you. Element. Um, so this speaks to exactly what happened on the Clara Street project. They were in a multifamily low density zone at twelve at ten dwelling units per acre, and the um, 
the density bonus program written by the state states that the applicant is subject to the density as um, outlined in either the zoning code or the general plan. And our general plan was not specific about the um, multifamily low. It just states that um, the, the multifamily designation is 20 units per acre is how it was worded. So we'd like to modify that to say designation is between 10 to 20 dwelling units per acre depending on the zoning classification. Then I'd also suggest adding parentheses after that to make it really clear that RML is 10 dwelling units per acre, RMM is 15, and RMH is 20. So there's absolutely no just question that it, it's, it's in sync with both documents. So, um, And then next is visitor accommodation. So previously we've had visitor accommodation as a, um, as a land use designation within the, within the code. When we updated the zoning, the zoning map, we got rid of the just visitors serving and the, um, we have visitor serving now as an overlay and all, um, all zones have, will have a, an underlying zone such as the Monarch Cove Inn became R1 with a VS overlay. These, Again, these document the maps have to be in sync. So, by removing the visitors serving in the zoning code, we need to remove the visitor accommodations in the general plan land use map. So they'll have their underlying zone shown in the land use map. And of course, under the zoning code, they're still privy privy to the uh, visitors serving uses, and there'll be an overlay as well on the general plan land use map. So they're just. Uh, Again, reflecting one another and being in sync. And then this is relative to the theater site. So prior it said a hotel in the village, and now we're specifying a hotel in the village at the former Capitola theater site for the increased <coughs> floor area ratio <coughs> allowance. Is it adequate to call it the former Capitola theater site, or should we put a, a, an APN in there? and be really specific? I mean, does it matter? I believe this is adequate. Um, there's actually about three different APNs for that site. I think we added the APNs into the zoning code. So if you'd like the APNs, I'm happy to add them. Just clarify it for people that don't know where the theater was, because mm -hmm. the farther we get away from it having right. been there. Yeah. Okay, so add APNs. Right. And Katie, on that um, factor of 3.0 um, for that site, uh, did you see in the records where the, the, there was uh, any estimation of the number of hotel units would, would be generated from that factor? No, but it was very clear that you can't go, I, I don't know the number, I don't, I don't think that was part. I, I do recall the, con the discussion at the time of general plan adoption regarding this number and then also it would be al allowed on 41st Avenue um, and landing on a floor area ratio that was okay but I don't recall yeah, and I apologize some uh, designs created during that process for the site I think there were around 40 units or something, something like that I could oh the yeah, some well, some of the initial designs were up to 80, 80 units mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and so well, I, I would just encourage, you know, uh, future commissioners to try to correlate that factor with what mm. may potentially be built there uh, in terms of the number of units, uh, because I think the, the number of units is what has the greatest impact. Um, and I know that that's a discretionary <coughs> number, the 3.0 on the part of the council, but um, I, I, I would just caution and hopefully the commissioners and council will evaluate that question when they're re-looking at that um, and look in the impacts uh, in the village. Um, and another thing I noted um, in the staff report is that on 41st Avenue, the factor is 2.0. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't quite logically figure out why it's 2.0 um, on 41st Avenue, which has the greatest land, ma or land area an ability to um, 
uh, do development and 3.0 in the village, which was much more constrained. Um, so it just didn't, that those didn't seem to be uh, consistent in my mind. <coughs> and so I just wanted to bring that up and maybe, you know, maybe have you look at that as well when you bring it back. Sure. And I, um, in terms of the 3.0, the, you know, the, the other limiting factor was that the bluff has to, the top of the bluff green has to stay visible from certain right. Point. So I think the 3.0, but as well as knowing that there's a large bluff behind it and that that view had to be maintained mm -hmm. was a comfortable box at the end of the day. But um, yes, I recall that meeting when there was a <coughs> lot of um, debate uh, and when that final number came through. So, okay. And we do have a diagram in the general plan that shows what the former Capitola Theater property is. And there are a number of other restrictions in there about, you know, how tall the hotel can be. How, so all of those probably should be looked at. Okay. Um, and next was, this was along the same lines of cleaning things up after the zoning code update. In the zoning code, we clarified where the additional floor area could be um, and that it would include the entire mall property. So that's more clear in the new explanation. Um, I have slides on each of the changes to the map. I have a feeling we may have a couple questions on certain locations. So with that, we're recommending um, approval or continuation tonight of this matter. But with that, I'll conclude my presentation and I'm happy to bring up any slides. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions from commissioners? on Katie's report. Uh, are there any members of the audience that would like to address the commission um, on the general plan report? Hearing none. Um, no, come on up. Yeah. Hello. I'm a 35-year resident of Capitola, and I have some concerns about the change of the zoning change for the 9-11 property on Capitol Avenue for a multi-use and existing there right now is a historic um, building. It's the carriage house and the tea room that was built in the 1870s and I'm just curious on what the multi-use would make changes to this or what, what would be happening to those structures. Okay, um, so Currently, this property um, was, I'll talk about the general plan map first and then the zoning map. The general plan historically has shown this property as multifamily, and it's always had a commercial use up front and then residential in the back. But it's, it's been like, a business in the back. It's in a business in the back. So um, during the zoning code update, we realized there were there were two designations on there. The front of the property was a mixed use designation of community neighborhood or commercial neighborhood commercial, and the rear portion of the property was zoned for um, multifamily, medium density. So when we cleaned up the zoning uh, map, we said this is really the better fit for this to allow flexibility in the site is mixed-use neighborhood, you're actually allowed to have residential mixed-use within the mixed-use neighborhood, so it really fits. The historic structure in the front, it will not impact because we have separate standards for historic, so should they choose to come forward with a development proposal, this is one of the oldest structures in Capitola, and it would be protected under our, um, our requirements for historic preservation. Okay, that was okay. my concern. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the commission on this? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna see none. I'm gonna close the public hearing portion of the meeting. I'll bring it back for uh, com to commissioners and see what your will is. So. I guess we're gonna continue at least that one issue and um, do we wanna approve this as a package, I think, don't we? Or do we wanna take it part by part? Um, I think it'd be best to approve it as a package and it'd probably be helpful for me to um, educate the new planning commissioners on it in the next 
in January, so they're all aware and We should probably just continue to hold. So I'd just like to make a couple of comments since I'm not gonna be here at the next meeting. Um, I did go through um, all the comments and, and from March to October, it's it, or from March to December actually, it's been a long time, mm -hmm. but I was really impressed with the, the level of matching between all of my notes and all of the conversations that we had and um, I, I couldn't find anything you missed. Um, the, the 20 in commercial, I didn't have any notes explaining anything about that, so I'm kind of with you. I don't know why that was in there like that. I would caution, as Sam said, in really you know figuring it out because when I think about some of the projects that we've seen, we did manage it. Um, we managed the number of units based on the parking, and we determined that um, certain projects really couldn't happen the the way that they needed to pencil out for the developer because of that restriction. So if we lose that and we remove any maximum, it could really present a, a crazy place in the mall site specifically. But I, I just wanted to say my hat's off to you for, you know, getting it, getting it done and getting it um, to this commission. Um, and there was a lot going on last year, so yeah, yeah. don't. Yeah. Don't feel bad about that. Okay, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Understandable. Thank you, Linda, for your comments. And with that, I guess, is there a motion to continue this item to, um, well, we'll just say <coughs> future meeting? Mm -hmm. uh, um, let's actually, if we could say a date certain, because there was a lot of noticing okay. involved with the mapping. Certainly. So All right. the January, it's not our typical, it's the third uh, that give you enough time? Say to the next planning <coughs> commission meeting. The next planning commission meeting. Yeah. That will give me plenty of time. Okay. Okay. So there's a motion to uh, continue this item until the next planning commission meeting. Um, I, well, somebody. I'll make that motion. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded. I'll second it. And then second it. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Isn't that a reverse refusal? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you call shoveling it <laughs> off, <laughs> kicking the can down the Moving street. Moving it down. <laughs> right. The motion passes unanimously. Um, the next item is item 5C, which is uh, a uh, proposed um, um, guidance document on uh, story polls. Um, and um, Katie, you want to give a presentation on this? Actually, Sasha's going to give the presentation oh, on this yeah. this evening. Thank you, Sasha. On September 6, 2018, the Planning Commission asked staff to consider developing story poll guidance for applicants. This presentation provides an overview of the guidelines created by staff. A detailed guide will be posted on the Community Development Department's website. The City of Capitola Planning Commission may ask applicants to have story polls and project identification signs installed on the site of an active development application. Story polls help illustrate the massing and height of a proposed structure and make it easier for city residents and staff to understand a project. They also provide a visual notice to the community that a development is being considered on a particular property. When story polls are required, the applicant must submit a story poll plan to show the locations where the polls will be installed. The polls and netting should be installed one week prior to the Planning Commission hearing and be kept in place until the project has been acted upon and the appeal period has ended. The number of story poles may vary with each project, but they must demonstrate the height and mass of the project and be constructed of sturdy material. At least two foot wide orange woven plastic netting must be erected to represent the roof lines of the proposed structure. Once installed, a licensed surveyor or a civil engineer must submit written verification that the height and position of the poles and netting accurately represents the height and location of the proposed structure. Sites where story poles are required must have a color perspective drawing and project identification signs that indicate the scheduled public hearing date and availability of plans for review at the Community Development Department. <coughs> Once a final action is taken and the appeal period is over, the poles and netting must be removed at the applicant's expense within 30 days. So. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. the policy. I think one thing that um, at 210 Central, when that application went through, we should have had a color rendering on site. I think a lot of people would have walked by and like looked at the image and understood what was going on, mm -hmm. rather than just a notice stating that there is an addition proposed. It'd be really nice for them to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, that's what I was I was thinking because I did hear um, the people expressing not knowing what those were for. What what do they represent? What am I looking at? Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, could we add something to the project identification uh, sign that would inform folks about if they were story posts, what what they are meant to represent? That is and in the draft document that it they'd is, be okay. required to have a color rendering. It you know Does we should probably move it earlier. Rendering? It, no, do you, it, it doesn't. It seems, seems to me that that that's a pretty expensive little <laughs> item to mm -hmm. add in there. Maybe just a rendering, because that would come with the plans in For anyway. elevations? An elevation or something yeah, like elevations. that. I don't think we want to uh -huh. go to making them do a colored rendering. OK. But, but we I, will. But I'm not even sure if you had a, even a rendering <coughs> when people are just looking at the orange netting. That, and if there's nothing explaining, what is that? What's that meant to show? Right. If you have a drawing of what it's going to look like, that would help them understand what they're looking at, but a colored rendering is something quite different than. Yeah, okay. <coughs> I, I think the confusion is that where we wrote it in the pamphlet, the information that you're required to, al we're, we're also required to have the elevation or the rendering on site is beyond, it's after the noticing requirement. So we'll do a better job of putting that mm -hmm. statement earlier in the document because I think um, it's easily missed. Okay. So, okay. We'll make so sure you that's clear. The, you have the sign that says notice of a proposed development that describes what's happening here, and then if netting is required, then you also have some kind of a sketch or drawing or that's yeah. acceptable to the community development department. Okay. That's my understanding well. of what. But yeah, anytime there's story polls, <coughs> there would have to be an image of what the story polls represent. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have some uh, comments on this. I think the uh, criteria are very good, but what's missing is uh, some standards for when we require these. And I think they should be, it should be very rare. Absolutely. Because yeah. number one, I think they're an eyesore. <coughs> number two, I think they're misleading. In our last example, that was the best example. All these people signed a petition and thought the Empire State Building was being recreated <laughs> on Depot Hill, and it was all a mistake. <laughs> it's all a big mistake. Um, I think you need to get a coastal permit because it's a development under the Coastal Act to put those up. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think we should be very. Uh, we should have something in there about when story polls are required, and I think it should be very uh, rarely. I mean, this, the standard should be a bit tough one. I would suggest that we place that in the. Uh, design in our chapter on architectural and site review and design permits so that it's actually in the code. I'd hate to make a determination of when they're required in a poli in yeah, in a policy document. That should really it yeah. belongs in the code. So when some, we yeah. when we do our revisions to the code, I'll I'll put that in as a note as something we need to cuz it just says upon request if if ne if the Who's planning the planning, planning commission. Yeah. yeah. It actually yeah. says the city, so it, we could make that much clearer that only upon the request of the Planning Commission. I was thinking we should have like a supermajority requirement or something. I, I'm, I'm with Commissioner Newman. I'm totally against the netting. One, I mean, it's, it's a cost thing. It's a cost issue. And really it comes out of, well, I don't want to say the word hysteria. It comes out of maybe some uh, misleading concerns of neighborhoods, of people. And I think as planning commissioners, we can make that determination. And, and where you see this orange netting is where they have other standards in place uh, for um, view concept, like Carmel, for example. It's because of view shed, uh, solar light. I mean, there's a lot of different things. And for me, I think it's that slippery slope. But I, I've been pretty negative tonight, so I didn't want, I'm glad you <laughs> got up there. And I'm not done being negative, so. <coughs> 
<laughs> we the bike thing. I'm gonna, yeah, we, we still have the bike thing to go. So I'm with Commissioner Newman on this. I think I think it's not. If we're going to make someone do it, then I, we need so, a standard, obviously. But to have a policy that is like, this is what we do. It it just to me I think is misleading, and I hate to see this uh, start going down a path. And the 210 Central is a good example because they met all the requirements of any structure other than the, they had a historical home. So the massium would have never been a discussion. And we, you know, it's, it's just a big expense, I think, for the homeowner that's unnecessary. But it gives opponents uh, a tool, an extra tool <coughs> to kind of delay and defer. And Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I yeah. actually agree with both of you. I, th I think they, they do tend to be pretty much of an eyesore. And I think for the average person, it, it's hard for them to judge or get a perspective from. Um, probably there are going to be some cases, however, where because of community concerns and your desire to work with the community, you're going to want to ask that they be put up. Uh, so it's nice to have a standard of, of what they should be. Uh, but it seems like that should come from the Planning Commission uh, if you feel there's no other valid way or option to um, uh, solve that particular development. And I guess my question would be, can it be an industry standard that we refer to or so it's not like a policy or so, it's just, okay, we, we're going to request this for whatever certain situation, that rare circumstance that we decide to do that, and then we have a document to say this is the standard. That's not something that's readily available to to uh, make it so it becomes a an exception that's used more often than we want it to <coughs> yeah we can look and at how it's been applied in different jurisdictions and show you different thresholds and it seems right. like if a house meets the requirements for height and they're not going above the height limit exactly then what would be the necessity for them i agree well, if I, I may, I'm going to present a different point of view. And, um, and one, I, I, I think that the reason this has come up is because um, we did ask for that particular project to put in story poles. Um, and I know, I mean, in the two years that I've been on the commission and, uh, and then involved with the council, I don't believe that it's ever been done. I don't think this is meant to say that, well, now this has become a standard part of the process. I think it is going to be rare. Uh, and based upon time and place kind of circumstances. Um, and the benefit that I see in it, and what, because what I view is that we are assessing projects based upon two dimensional renderings. They're all just two dimensional pictures and drawings and lines on paper. And I don't think that we or no, the community gets a real sense of what is going there. Um, and when you have, and there we were dealing with a historical structure, um, which, and in that case, there was a house just down the street uh, which had been built uh, without story poles, and, and, and it is fairly overwhelming uh, in that neighborhood. And I think that that's what brought these together. So I think there are circumstances when there are appropriate, and I think this policy is just about, well, if we want to have that tool, um, that there should be some standards that we can refer applicants to to be able to use. But I, I mean, it should be on a limited basis when the Planning Commission feels that it is necessary to do. And hopefully that will be under rare and unusual circumstances. So, um, but I do, I mean, I, I think one, it gets us out of, of uh, uh, you know, trying to um, process. Um, uh, you know, three-dimensional um, projects based mostly on two-dimensional uh, renderings. Um, so, so that's that. And um, so, I, I, I guess that now where we are is uh, maybe me asking the public. Is anyone in the public that uh, would like <laughs> to join this conversation? Yeah, Peter, come on up. Uh, thank you, Peter Wilk. Um, I have no problem with story poles. The thing that got me was uh, you know you mentioned something about being certified. 
so I actually was requested at one point to have story poles put up and I envisioned it to, okay I need to put up six foot and you know, some orange netting and mm -hmm. and done but the notion of then having to go out and have somebody our survey with their land survey or certify the height I think the idea was just that there was a commissioner who wanted to get a sense like Sam was just saying of you know what what, what it looks like and I, again, I hate to put a, a undue burden on the applicant um, to ask, you know, to get more more expense with consultants and surveyors and that kind of thing. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Oh, I'm a little confused. We have a policy here that's great, except it doesn't tell us when to use them. Mm -hmm. And how do we <coughs> approve this policy, but also? add something to our design review standards that says something along the lines that story poles are an option in an unusual situation where there's a, you know, a, a perceived need uh, that can't be met in other ways. And but can, can we not just use it as a state, like as a guidance document, not as a policy? Yeah, it can be just um, more of a, a pamphlet that's, yeah. that's available. The frustration of, up on the part of the owners when the story polls were requested and we had nothing yeah. in place. Yeah. So th this can I be our, ha that. you know, more of a pamphlet, not a policy. Yeah, um, and then yeah. we <clears throat> should come back to you with the edits to the zoning code to state when, sure, Jim, yes. yeah, when, when it, it's appropriate. And I also kind of got hung on the, the certified, somebody certified has to come and look. And I know that we want to make sure that what we're looking at is really representative of what's going to get built but it's usually the contractor that's involved that actually puts up the story poles and I think that should be that that should be good enough we shouldn't have an additional verification requirement on top so, so the example there would be on Wharf Road when they um, I think it was 1890 Wharf Road the they Strock residence they, they put together poles and they showed what the future garage the location of it would be Mm -hmm. and the height and they based it on their measuring tapes but that and was a voluntary measurements for yeah, it was voluntary and uh, measurements from the fence but whether or not the peak that you saw was it exactly the height that a surveyor would have said it was that and they, they their guys knew what they were doing and they were going to build this in the future but so it's probably you've pretty close seen story poles so. i mean they're up there moving around yeah, that, yeah. it's gonna it's like not gonna be yeah. the, you know eighth of an <laughs> inch yeah, this yeah. Looks like yeah. A running fence. so if you're yeah. if, General, if you're com okay. comfortable with that we can rewrite that portion to make it yeah it's, yeah. it's a more general more I mean, story grown. poles are really there to <laughs> generally tell you what the massing is going to be Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not ever expected to be absolute. Okay. Okay. Um, you guys feel like you have the direction to maybe. I do. Work this and. Yeah, we'll come back with back the. When I'm not here. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm not here either. <laughs> when I'm not here. Oh. Yeah. But we'll have a little pamphlet in case it ever comes up again. Okay. That that Perfect. will be available. Okay, so next, uh, b bike share. So the city council asked staff, we brought bike share to them in um, early October, and they asked us to, um, con to start looking into researching bike share and reach out to the public and see if there's support in Capitola for bike share, as we're seeing all the little red bikes show up in town regardless of having a bike share program or not so i looked into some of the policy documents that we have our long-range planning documents our 2011 bicycle transportation plan is definitely supportive of a future bike share it's interesting you know we talk about 20 percent of trips an increase from um Citywide goal of 5% of all trips and 20% of work trips made by bicycle by 2020. Actually, bike share is a great way to measure that. Now that the smart technology is there and we can see ridership, we'll actually be able to come to you and say the new, how we're meeting certain goals through this new technology. Um, also, under the general plan, there's um, you know calls for complete streets, enhancement for mobility throughout Capitola and Capitola Village. Um, and a complete network of bikeways and bicycle facilities in Capitola. So definitely, again, supportive of bicycle infrastructure and the possibility of bike share. And then the Climate Action Plan 
actually calls out, encourage and support nonprofit or volunteer organization in creating a bicycle program. I, I think the reason why it says um, a nonprofit or volunteer organization is because as the city, we don't want to take on the cost of these in the previous um, ways that bicycle shares were set up. But now we're, they're at no cost to cities if you set, the, set up the contracts correctly. Um, I think that would have, that measure would have been drafted differently under today's new um, programs that are out there. So bike share growth in the U.S., I found this fascinating how much it's taken off from 2010 to 2016. Sure. And this has a lot to do with the new um, technology that's tied to bikes and also the pedal assist. It's really, I don't know if any of you have ridden these, the jump bikes or gotten on an electric bike, but it's really amazing what y how you can ride up a hill and it feels like you're on flat level ground. It's made it a lot of fun and uh, what happened to the ones that aren't electric? I think they're, they're, I think they're getting phased out. You know, I heard of someone recently told me of a story of going, traveling to Denver, and they have their own, the old bike share program that nobody's utilizing. And it's the, and then they've had other systems come in and everyone's utilizing the electric and they're using the scooters. Well, Scottsdale, so, like two years ago, there was hundreds of line bikes all over the place. You couldn't even avoid them and now they're you can't even find them they disappeared yeah. so almost mm. no time because <laughs> they're not set up for the electric huh. and i wondered why we're doing an electric version rather than a pedal version well it's both really they're both it? there's it's like pedal electric assist. and yeah so it only assists you when you need it to you oh, don't it, it, it don't have to utilize the electric all the time so <laughs> it, it depends on the bike. Okay. So jump bikes, the electric kicks in as soon as you start pedaling. So it really makes it a really easy bicycle ride. Um, so I actually had the opportunity to go out with multiple community development directors in the region and we went and tested the bikes and we had a lunch and we talked about bike share and, and different. But you get on these bikes and they're those ones are automatically pedal assist. I think you can buy different types of technology, you know, different mm -hmm. types of bikes to trigger it on or off. So the new, the new smart technology is the electric bikes. They've got GPS, so they can track these anywhere. You can pay for them. So just on my phone, walking up to a bike, it gives me, I tell them where I am, they tell me where the bike is. It gives me a code that I can put into the back of the bicycle. And they pretty much, are they're dockless, they are self-locking, or they can be locked. Um, they have that little bar that goes out that can be locked to anything, so. Um, and here it's showing just the, the GPS technology. This is what you would see on your phone for Santa Cruz. You go to a red dot and you pay for it and pick up the bike, and they're relatively inexpensive, so what, the first. What are the black dots? Are the I think the they're in use, possibly, or I'm not quite sure what the black dot is. Do either of these? Docking station with oh, okay. like a bunch of them. That's the docking station. Which I've noticed there's not typically bikes on the docking stations unless you see them first thing in the morning when they've been. Um, so the steps to establishing a bike share program, public outreach and research, that's where we are <laughs> now. Um, the other ones are not in any specific order based on Another step is that we'd have to select a vendor. We also have to, under our circumstances, I'd like to update the municipal code to make it um, one of the biggest problems with bike share is parking and where they're parked and how they're in the way and parked anywhere. Our um, municipal code is not very strong in, in regulating that right now and um, I'm preparing if there's, with the support that I'm seeing for bike share so far, to go to the city council in early of next year to look at new bicycle parking standards. And regardless, if we adopt a bike share program, I think we have to make those tighter because bike share, if it's adopted by the county, is definitely coming to us where it's out of our hands at that point. And then also encroachment permits. We're gonna look at the language in encroachment permits to make sure that they're strong enough um, if we're gonna be considering more bicycle parking um, infrastructure. So the public outreach, we um, put out a community survey for a month and we um, noticed that on our website and we put little cards around town in some of the restaurants and coffee shops. We had a pretty good uh, feedback on that and I'll bring up a couple of the, the 
items that came back. I've also presented this to the Commission on Environment and the Traffic and Parking Committee. So really good comments came out of both of those. One, for the Commission on the Environment, one really good point was, well, how do they, re are, when we look at vendors, make sure they're responsible in how they recycle um, the batteries. And then a lot of concern about parking um, the, the bikes and just really thinking about the village because of the tight circumstances in the village and how we can manage that. And then uh, research, we've been looking at best practices so that when we do move forward with new standards to make sure that we've really thought it through and w how we can prevent any issues. Um, contacting different bike share companies, seeing what's out there. And then one of the big things is within Santa Cruz, if we really want this to replace the car for certain trips, um, looking at regional coordination. So t we've been talking with the county, seeing what they're doing. We definitely know what Santa Cruz is doing. We've had a look at their contract. Um, so we're just going through those steps and seeing could, you know, how could we set this up so it really is an alternative at the regional scale to the car. Um, and then from all of that research, we'll identify the appropriate program parameters and move forward. It's selecting a vendor. Um, and I already discussed this, that we'll have to update the municipal code, looking at street vending, bicycle parking, and encroachment permits. And the more I look into the parking, there's good examples out there of cities where they just don't allow bike shares to have their, um, there's uh, just areas in which you simply just don't allow the bikes, um, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of, there's a, you know, where Muscle Beach is down mm -hmm. in Venice. So Venice along their um, coastal um, sidewalk there, you're not allowed to take the bike share bikes on there. And I think one influence of that is probably because they've already established a great rental program there with local companies that are renting all these bicycles out. But they're getting to the point, and I, I actually saw it f um, when I was down there, is you would see scooters approaching that area, and then they, they have some type of technology that they can't get on to the sidewalk <laughs> and get on to that area. So there, there's the technology is that smart mm. that it avoids, oh, the, yeah. avoids the issue. In talking to the planner down there, they don't have that technology built into the bikes yet, but they built it into their regulations, so at such times the technology is available. They want the bikes to decrease their speed limit when they come into certain areas. So something we can you know, ask for and request, it's not here yet, but it's a dreamy idea and it may help us in the village in the future. But um, so we'll be, we'll be looking at, are there areas in different ways um, to warn folks when they go to park, especially in the village, like this is, you know, they, they can, you can get a message sent to your phone that makes them aware that they have to be parked to bicycle um, docking station or so. Do, in, in um, well, the jump bikes, do they have in their business model like incentives to have riders return them to the docking stations? And so Santa Cruz is um, requesting that they build that into their program now. So if you return a bike to a docking station, you could actually get a monetary uh, money back or, you know, so, so is incentives. There an age limit? Of there the is. Um, you're supposed to be 18 to ride these bikes um, because the uh, helmet, uh, you have to <laughs> wear a helmet at 18. So Yeah, I saw that that was a big concern was the helmet issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and who is the Uber vendor? Because I was reading your that's survey, there's a lot of anti-Uber bike people out there. That's Jump. Jump is? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, Uber bought Jump. Do we so know what, the, prob what the, the people who were complaining about that one specifically, do we know what their issue is with the Jump bikes? You know, it wasn't clear. Okay. So, yeah. mm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit on the bike survey results. When we asked, you know, do you support bike share, wh which best describes you, there was straight support for 60 by 60 percent we um we had a standard at the bottom that said i support bike share as long as the city you know as long as we consider this and 25 percent of our responses were in that category so really high um 85 percent support some of those comments were safety of the bicyclists and the pedestrians 
utilize the same system as Santa Cruz, that regional aspect, um, make sure there's permanent drop and pickup sites, prevent bike parking issues, observe bike laws, it was safety, 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 most of the comments, and then helmet safety and limit the number of bikes. So limiting the number of bikes, we would wanna do a staggered rollout to make sure there's not too much of a implication on the residents. Um, if the city to were initiate a bike share program, which of the following would you prefer? And regional was definitely, we heard that loud and clear. So again, we're talking with the county, talking with the city, whoops. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Which of the following would you like to see included in a new bicycle parking regulations? So the number one was offer incentives so people park them correctly. So we'll definitely talk to the vendor, future vendor, about that. Um, do not lock them to trees. However, make sure they're locked to a fixed object and to allow them in public spaces as long as there's no problems with flow. So, and then the others. Park on any curb, if there was something there they could walk them to, is that? It, it really seemed, it was more about, um, yeah, as long as you maintain, as long as, so that one was kind of more <coughs> open-ended of allow people to park. So, yeah, you could park on maybe. Um, wide sidewalk. A wide sidewalk, as long as you maintain a certain area, or you could park your bicycle in the park, as long as it wasn't on the footpath and it's in the grass and out of the way of interfering with any circulation. That one was a little bit unclear. And then the others that the comments that were generated under other were to limit to designated areas, no parking on sidewalks, so a little more restrictive than the make sure there's four feet of clearance, just flat out don't allow them on sidewalks. Um, make sure there's more bike racks. I think that's the best approach actually in this when we're looking at bike share is make sure there's plenty of bike racks and that there's penalties. So, um, and in thinking this through, as you go through Santa Cruz and you see all of their docking stations, I almost think it would be better for Capitola after seeing these docking stations that are empty a lot of the time, that we just um, have a standardized, you see those like the loop bicycle parking stations that just have something standard. So if I ride to work on my regular bike and, and I'm going to work in the village, I can, I, I don't feel like I'm attaching to some private company's bike um, rack. It's mm -hmm. everyone can utilize them, but they should be plentiful. And then one of the big things we heard throughout the survey was concern for the village. This picture was taken a few days ago. Mm -hmm. And just, we really need to, the village Did you guys different. stage this? Or no. Oh, you don't. No, it was. Uh, were they left there for a long time? I mean, did people, were people using them and they went into a restaurant and they parked them there and they came back to them or? Larry Laurent came back from being down in the village <laughs> and he shared, he sent me the picture. He oh. said, oh, check it out. Jump bikes at the Esplanade. So. I've seen him down there <laughs> a few times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know what they well, were, yeah, I wasn't seen there. Left down there. I haven't seen them there for, you know, abandoned, if you will, mm -hmm. down there. And that's what they're for, so people can ride down and go shopping and do what they want to do and ride back. Yep, and there's a penalty. If you if you did take a Santa Cruz bike and you rode it here and left it, the first time I think they let you off, but if you do it twice, it's a $25 fee mm -hmm. for leaving it outside the geo fence, mm -hmm. which is their terminology for the There's a lot of trial and error that's gonna have to yeah. take place here. Yeah. So you have to make sure you don't lock in something yeah. too soon sure. yeah. right. okay so that concludes my presentation any <coughs> any comments you'd like me to bring back to the city council on this well I, I was just um, one wondering whether Chief McManus has weighed in um, and um, on the program and and I'm thinking whether he's actually spoken maybe with uh, the Santa Cruz uh, Police Department you know really on what their experience has been what they're enforced you know how engaged they are in enforcing the rules or dealing with these bicycles and um, just so we have a sense from the enforcement side because mm -hmm. there will need to be some so. and who's going to do the enforcement is it the police department or is it going to be you know another agency within the government that does it so from the from what i understand from santa cruz the burden typically goes back to public works um, and then the other part of enforcement, 
is uh, the public enforcing these through their phones and just going on the jump location and reporting bikes. And then in your contract, you can build in response times to any complaints that are received. Okay. But, but I will check with Chief McManus. Um, the definitely Public Works has been very involved so far because in there's a w with what's been happening with scooters being dropped off we're making sure that our code is strong enough to make sure they get they don't get dropped off in Capitola yeah <laughs> so. and I would caution I think it could be just speculation on my part but the bikes that I see are the jump bikes so the anti uber bikes um, might simply be because that's what they're seeing and they're bright colored and you start noticing them and they have been coming into Capitola but I haven't seen them abandoned anywhere I've, I've seen them you know being used and one of the huge benefits of that specific program is that the bike is self-locking so people who have their own bikes and had them stolen and now don't want to go make the investment and get another bike they can ride these down here and they can't be stolen because they just lock up. So there's a huge benefit for that and, and I would expect there would be a lot of traffic bringing them in because people don't want to bring their own bike down and have it get ripped off. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you. I think with that, we've come to the end of our agenda for the evening. Um, and, um, and I think just in closing, uh, since this is my um, last time as chair and last planning commission meeting, um, I did want to thank all the commissioners for your support. It's really been um, a pleasure and a really education for me to work with each and every one of you. I've learned a lot in my two years here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll just say I look forward to collaborating with all of you uh, and staff as well in a different capacity. So uh, thank you. Um, and thank you, Capitola, uh, for your support. Um, and, um, and I do want to announce, let everybody know that uh, the swearing in of the new council members will be on December the 13th uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, here in these chambers. Uh, with that, I'll adjourn this meeting. Good night. Good night. Uh, and if I may. Oh, and happy holidays, everyone. I just really want to express my appreciation to all of you. Um, it's been an incredible five years since I've been here and working with each of you during that time. Um, your individual unique attributes that you brought to the planning, the code update. It's really, I think each of you has a, takes a different angle and approach to, and has a different uh, perspective of Capitola, and it really made for a solid, um, a great document in the end, in which I think the thought that was, that you all brought to the table and the amount of homework and how many nights you probably fell asleep reading the zoning code, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, the, the dedication of this group has been amazing and it's just really been a pleasure working with all of you. And in the future, as, you're, as residents and coming in to speak, please feel free to stop by any time. Let us know if you have any items you wanna talk about, but we, I look forward to continuing the relationship moving forward and all the best as a council member. Thank so, um, and thank you for your continued um, dedication to this city, TJ and Ed. We really appreciate your, all the time. So thank, you. Well, thank you, Katie. Susan, yeah. and Linda, and, and uh, Sam, good luck.